Section 28 of Coningsby or the New Generation by Benjamin Disraeli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 8, Chapter 3. Lord Monmouth was sitting in the same dressing room in which he was first introduced to the reader. On the table were several packets of papers that were open and in course of reference, and he dictated his observations to Monsieur Villebecq, who was writing at his left hand. Thus were they occupied when Coningsby was ushered into the room. "'You see, Harry,' said Lord Monmouth, "'that I am much occupied to-day, yet the business on which I wish to communicate with you is so pressing that it could not be postponed.' He made a sign to Villebecq, and his secretary instantly retired. "'I was right in pressing your return to England,' continued Lord Monmouth to his grandson, who was a little anxious as to the impending communication, which you could not in any way anticipate. These are not times when young men should be out of sight. Your public career will commence immediately. The government have resolved on a dissolution. My information is from the highest quarter. You may be astonished, but it is a fact. They are going to dissolve their own House of Commons. Notwithstanding this and the Queen's name, we can beat them, but the race requires the finest jockeying. We can't give a point. Tadpole has been here to me about Darlford. He came specially with a message, I may say an appeal, for one to whom I can refuse nothing. The government count on the seat, though with the new registration tis nearly a tie. If we had a good candidate, we could win. But Rigby won't do. He is too much of the old clique, used up, a hack, besides a beaten horse we are assured the name of coningsby would be a host there is a considerable section who support the present fellow who will not vote against a coningsby they have thought of you as a fit person and i have approved of the suggestion you will therefore be the candidate for darlford with my entire sanction and support and i have no doubt you will be successful you may be sure i shall spare nothing and it will be very gratifying to me, after being robbed of all our boroughs, that the only Coningsby who cares to enter Parliament should nevertheless be able to do so as early as I could fairly desire. Coningsby, the rival of Mr. Milbank, on the hustings of Darlford, vanquished a victorious equally a catastrophe. The fierce passions, the gross insults, the hot blood and the cool lies, the ruffianism and the ribaldry, perhaps the domestic discomfiture and mortification which he was about to be the means of bringing on the roof he loved best in the world, occurred to him with anguish. The countenance of Edith, haughty and mournful last night, rose to him again. He saw her canvassing for her father, and against him. Madness! And for what was he to make this terrible and costly sacrifice? For his ambition? not even for that divinity or demon for which we all immolate so much. Mighty ambition, forsooth, to succeed to the Rigbys, to enter the House of Commons as slave and a tool, to move according to instructions, and to labour for the low designs of petty spirits, without even the consolation of being a dupe. What sympathy could there exist between Coningsby and the great Conservative Party, that for ten years, in an age of revolution, had never promulgated a principle, whose only intelligible and consistent policy seemed to be an attempt, very grateful, of course, to the feelings of an English royalist, to revive Irish Puritanism, who, when in power in 1835, had used that power only to evince their utter ignorance of church principles, and who were at this moment, when Coningsby was formally solicited to join their ranks, in open insurrection against the prerogatives of the English monarchy. "'Do you anticipate, then, an immediate dissolution, sir?' inquired Coningsby, after a moment's pause. "'We must anticipate it, though I think it is doubtful. It may be next month, it may be in the autumn, they may tide over another year, as Lord Eskdale thinks, and his opinion always weighs with me. He is very safe. Tadpole believes they will dissolve at once, but whether they dissolve now, or in a month's time, or in the autumn, or next year, our course is clear. 
we must declare our intentions immediately we must hoist our flag monday next there is a great conservative dinner at darlford you must attend it that will be the finest opportunity in the world for you to announce yourself don't you think sir said coningsby that such an announcement would be rather premature it is in fact embarking in a contest which may last a year perhaps more what you say is very true said lord monmouth no doubt it is very troublesome very disgusting any canvassing is but we must take things as we find them you cannot get into parliament now in the good old gentlemanlike way and we ought to be thankful that this interest has been fostered for our purpose coningsby looked on the carpet cleared his throat as if about to speak and then gave something like a sigh i think you would better be off the day after to-morrow said lord monmouth i have sent instructions to the steward to do all he can in so short a time for i wish you to entertain the principal people you are most kind you are always most kind to me dear sir said coningsby in a hesitating tone and with an air of great embarrassment but in truth i have no wish to enter parliament what said lord monmouth i feel that i am not sufficiently prepared for so great a responsibility as a seat in the house of commons said coningsby responsibility said lord monmouth smiling what responsibility is there how can any one have a more agreeable seat the only person to whom you are responsible is your own relation who brings you in and i don't suppose there can be any difference on any point between us you are certainly still young but i was younger by nearly two years when i first went in and i found no difficulty there can be no difficulty all you have to do is to vote with your party as for speaking if you have a talent that way take my advice don't be in a hurry learn to know the house learn the house to know you if a man be discreet he cannot enter parliament too soon it is not exactly that sir said coningsby then what is it my dear harry you see to-day i have much to do yet as your business is pressing i would not postpone seeing you an hour i thought you would have been very much gratified you mentioned that i had nothing to do but to vote with my party sir replied coningsby you mean of course by that term what is understood by the conservative party of course our friends i am sorry said coningsby rather pale but speaking with firmness i am sorry that i could not support the conservative party by blank exclaimed lord monmouth starting in his seat some woman has got hold of him and made him a whig no my dear grandfather said coningsby scarcely able to repress a smile serious as the interview was becoming nothing of the kind i assure you no person can be more anti-whig i don't know what you are driving at sir said lord monmouth in a hard dry tone i wish to be frank sir said coningsby and i am very sensible of your goodness in permitting me to speak to you on the subject what i mean to say is that i have for a long time looked upon the conservative party as a body who have betrayed their trust more from ignorance i admit than from design yet clearly a body of individuals totally unequal to the exigencies of the epoch and indeed unconscious of its real character you mean giving up those irish corporations said lord monmouth well between ourselves i am quite of the same opinion but we must mount higher we must go to twenty-eight for the real mischief but what is the use of lamenting the past peel is the only man suited to the times and all that at least we must say so and try to believe so we can't go back and it is our own fault that we have let the chief power out of the hands of our own order it was never thought of at the time of your great-grandfather sir and if a commoner were for a season permitted to be the nominal premier to do the detail there was always a secret committee of great sixteen eighty-eight nobles to give him his instructions i should be very sorry to see secret committees of great sixteen eighty-eight nobles again said coningsby that what the devil do you want to see said lord monmouth 
political faith said coningsby instead of political infidelity hm said lord monmouth before i support conservative principles continued coningsby i merely wish to be informed what those principles aim to conserve it could not appear to be the prerogative of the crown since the principal portion of a conservative oration now is an invective against a late royal act which they describe as a bedchamber plot is it the church which they wish to conserve what is a threatened appropriation clause against an actual church commission in the hands of parliamentary laymen could the long parliament have done worse well then if it is neither the crown nor the church whose rights and privileges this conservative party propose to vindicate is it your house the house of lords whose powers they are prepared to uphold is it not notorious that the very man whom you have elected as your leader in that house declares among his conservative adherents that henceforth the assembly that used to furnish those very committees of great revolution nobles that you mention is to initiate nothing and without a struggle is to subside into that undisturbed repose which resembles the imperial tranquillity that secured the frontiers by paying tribute all this is vastly fine said lord monmouth but i see no means by which i can attain my object but by supporting peel after all what is the end of all parties and all politics to gain your object i want to turn our coronet into a ducal one and to get your grandmother's barony called out of abeyance in your favour it is impossible that peel can refuse me i have already purchased an ample estate with a view of entailing it on you and your issue you will make a considerable alliance you may marry if you please lady theresa sydney i hear the report with pleasure count on my at once entering into any arrangement conducive to your happiness my dear grandfather you have ever been to me only too kind and generous to whom should i be kind but to you my own blood that has never crossed me and of whom i have reason to be proud yes harry it gratifies me to hear you admired and to learn your success all i want now is to see you in parliament a man should be in parliament early there is a sort of stiffness about every man no matter what may be his talents who enters parliament late in life and now fortunately the occasion offers you will go down on friday feed the notabilities well speak out praise peel abuse o'connell and the ladies of the bedchamber anathematize all waverers say a good deal about ireland stick to the irish registration bill that's a good card and above all my dear harry don't spare that fellow millbank remember in turning him out you not only gain a vote for the conservative cause at our coronet but you crush my foe spare nothing for that object i count on you boy i should grieve to be backward in anything that concerned your interest or your honour sir said coningsby with an air of great embarrassment i am sure you would i am sure you would said lord monmouth in a tone of some kindness and i feel at this moment continued coningsby that there is no personal sacrifice which i am not prepared to make for them except one my interests my affections they should not be placed in the balance if yours sir were at stake though there are circumstances which might involve me in a position of as much mental distress as a man could well endure but i claim for my convictions my dear grandfather a generous tolerance i can't follow you sir said lord monmouth again in his hard tone our interests are inseparable and therefore there can never be any sacrifice of conduct on your part what you mean by sacrifice of affections i don't comprehend but as for your opinions you have no business to have any other than those i uphold you are too young to form opinions i am sure i wish to express them with no unbecoming confidence replied coningsby i have never intruded them on your ear before but this being an occasion when you yourself said sir i was about to commence my public career i confess i thought it was my duty to be frank i would not entail on myself long years of mortification by one of those ill-considered entrances into political life 
which so many public men have cause to deplore. You go with your family, sir, like a gentleman. You are not to consider your opinions like a philosopher or a political adventurer. Yes, sir, said Coningsby, with animation, but men going with their families like gentlemen and losing sight of every principle on which the society of this country ought to be established produced the reform bill. Damn the reform bill, said Lord Monmouth. If the Duke had not quarrelled with Lord Grey on a coal committee, we should never have had the reform bill, and Grey would have gone to Ireland. You are in as great peril now as you were in 1830, said Coningsby. No, 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 said Lord Monmouth. The Tory party is organised now. They will not catch us napping again. These conservative associations have done the business. But what are they organised for, said Coningsby? at the best, to turn out the Whigs. And when you have turned out the Whigs, what then? You may get your ducal coronet, sir, but a duke now is not so great a man as a baron was but a century back. We cannot struggle against the irresistible stream of circumstances. Power has left our order. This is not an age for factitious aristocracy. As for my grandmother's barony, I should look upon the termination of its abeyance in my favour as the act of my political extinction. What we want, sir, is not to fashion new dukes and furbish up old baronies, but to establish great principles which may maintain the realm and secure the happiness of the people. Let me see authority once more honoured, a solemn reverence again the habit of our lives. Let me see property acknowledging, as in the old days of faith, that labour is his twin brother, and that the essence of all tenure is the performance of duty, let results such as these be brought about, and let me participate, however feebly, in the great fulfilment, and public life then indeed becomes a noble career, and a seat in Parliament, an enviable distinction. "'I tell you what it is, Harry,' said Lord Monmouth, very dryly, "'members of this family may think as they like, but they must act as I please. You must go down to Friday to Darlford and declare yourself a candidate for the town, or I shall reconsider our mutual positions. I would say you must go to-morrow, but it is only courteous to Rigby to give him a previous intimation of your movement, and that cannot be done to-day. I sent for Rigby this morning on other business which now occupies me, and find he is out of town. He will return to-morrow, and will be here at three o'clock when you can meet him. You will meet him, I doubt not, like a man of sense," added Lord Monmouth, looking at Coningsby with a glance such as he had never before encountered, who is not prepared to sacrifice all the objects of life for the pursuit of some fantastical puerilities. His lordship rang a bell on his table for Villebecque, and to prevent any further conversation, resumed his papers. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 It would have been difficult for any person, unconscious of crime, to have felt more dejected than Coningsby when he rode out of the courtyard of Monmouth House. The love of Edith would have consoled him for the destruction of his prosperity. The proud fulfilment of his ambition might in time have proved some compensation for his crushed affections but his present position seemed to offer no single source of solace. There came over him that irresistible conviction that is at times the dark room of all of us, that the bright period of our life is past, that a future awaits us only of anxiety, failure, mortification, despair, that none of our resplendent visions can ever be realised, and that we add but one more victim to the long and dreary catalogue of baffled aspirations. Nor could he indeed by any combination see the means to extricate himself from the perils that were encompassing him. There was something about his grandfather that defied persuasion. Prone as eloquent youth generally is to believe in the resistless power of its appeals, Coningsby despaired at once of ever moving Lord Monmouth. There had been a callous dryness in his manner, an unswerving purpose in his spirit, that at once baffled all attempts at influence. Nor could Coningsby forget the look he received when he quitted the room. There was no possibility of mistaking it. 
it said at once without periphrasis cross my purpose and i will crush you this was the moment when the sympathy if not the counsels of friendship might have been grateful a clever woman might have afforded even more than sympathy some happy device that might have even released him from the mesh in which he was involved and once coningsby had turned his horse's head to park lane to call on lady everingham but surely if there were a sacred secret in the world it was the one which subsisted between himself and edith no that must never be violated then there was lady wallinger he could at least speak with freedom to her he resolved to tell her all he looked in for a moment at a club to take up the court guide and find her direction a few men were standing in a bow window he heard mr Cassilla say so beau they say is booked at last the new beauty have you heard i saw him very sweet on her last night rejoined his companion has she any tin deuce deal they say replied mr Cassillis. the father is a cotton lord and they all have loads of tin you know nothing like them now he is in parliament is not he gad i believe he is said mr Cassillis. i never know who is in parliament these days i remember when there were only ten men in the house of commons who were not either members of books or this place everything is so deuced changed i hear tis an old affair of beau said another gentleman it was all done a year ago at rome or paris they say she refused him then said mr Cassillis. well that is tolerably cool for a manufacturer's daughter said his friend what next i wonder how the duke likes it said mr Cassillis. or the duchess added one of his friends or the everinghams added the other the duke will be deuced glad to see beau settled i take it said mr Cassillis. a good deal depends on the tin said his friend coningsby threw down the court guide with a sinking heart in spite of every insuperable difficulty hitherto the end and object of all his aspirations and all his exploits sometimes even almost unconsciously to himself was edith it was over the strange manner of last night was fatally explained the heart that had once been his was now another's to the man who still loves there is that conviction the most profound and desolate sorrow of which our nature is capable all the recollection of the past all the once cherished prospects of the future blend into one bewildering anguish coningsby quitted the club and mounting his horse rode rapidly out of town almost unconscious of his direction he found himself at length in a green lane near williston silent and undisturbed he pulled up his horse and summoned all his mind to the contemplation of his prospects edith was lost now should he return to his grandfather accept his mission and go down to darlford on friday favour and fortune power prosperity rank distinction would be the consequence of this step might not he add even vengeance was there to be no term to his endurance might not he teach this proud prejudiced manufacturer with all his virulence and despotic caprices a memorable lesson and his daughter too this betrothed after all of a young noble with her flush futurity of splendour and enjoyment was she to hear of him only if indeed she heard of him at all as of one toiling or trifling in the humbler positions of existence and wonder with a blush that he could ever have been the hero of her romantic girlhood what degradation in the idea his cheek burned at the possibility of such ignominy it was a conjuncture in his life that required decision he thought of his companions who looked up to him with such ardent anticipations of his fame of delight in his career and confidence in his leading were all these high and fond fancies to be balked on the very threshold of life was he to blunder tis the first step that leads to all and his was to be a wilful error he remembered his first visit to his grandfather and the delight of his friends at eton at his report on his return after eight years of initiation was he to lose the favour then so highly prized when the results which they had so long counted on were on the very eve of accomplishment 
parliament and riches and rank and power these were facts realities substances that none could mistake was he to sacrifice them for speculations theories shadows perhaps the vapours of a green and conceited brain no by heaven no he was like caesar by the starry river's side watching the image of the planets on his fatal waters the die was cast the sun set the twilight spell fell upon his soul the exaltation of his spirit died away beautiful thoughts full of sweetness and tranquillity and consolation came clustering round his heart like seraphs he thought of edith in her hours of fondness he thought of the pure and solemn moments when to mingle his name with the heroes of humanity was his aspiration and to achieve immortal fame the inspiring purpose of his life what were the tawdry accidents of vulgar ambition to him no domestic despot could deprive him of his intellect his knowledge the sustaining power of an unpolluted conscience if he possessed the intelligence in which he had confidence the world would recognize his voice even if not placed upon a pedestal if the principles of his philosophy were true the great heart of the nation would respond to their expression coningsby felt at this moment a profound conviction which never again deserted him that the conduct which would violate the affections of his heart or the dictates of the conscience however it may lead to immediate success is a fatal error conscious that he was perhaps verging on some painful vicissitude of his life he devoted himself to a love that seemed hopeless and to a fame that was perhaps a dream it was under the influence of these solemn resolutions that he wrote on his return home a letter to lord monmouth in which he expressed all that affection which he really felt for his grandfather and all the pangs which had cost him to adhere to the conclusions he had already announced in terms of tenderness and even humility he declined to become a candidate for darlford or even to enter parliament except as the master of his own conduct end of chapter four chapter five lady monmouth was reclining on a sofa in that beautiful boudoir which had been fitted up under the superintendence of mr rigby but as he then believed for the princess colonna the walls were hung with amber satin painted by delaroche with such subjects as might be expected from his brilliant and picturesque pencil fair forms heroes and heroines in dazzling costume the offspring of chivalry merging into what is commonly styled civilization moved in graceful or fantastic groups amid palaces and gardens the ceiling carved in the deep honeycomb fashion of the saracens was richly gilt and picked out in violet upon a violet carpet of velvet was represented the marriage of cupid and psyche it was about two hours after coningsby had quitted monmouth house and flora came in sent for by lady monmouth as was her custom to read to her as she was employed with some light work tis a new book of su said lucretia they say it is good flora seated by her side began to read reading was an accomplishment which distinguished flora but to-day her voice faltered her expression was uncertain she seemed but imperfectly to comprehend her page more than once lady monmouth looked round at her with an inquisitive glance suddenly flora stopped and burst into tears oh madam she at last exclaimed if you would but speak to mr coningsby all might be right what is this said lady monmouth turning quickly on the sofa then collecting herself in an instant she continued with less abruptness and more suavity than usual tell me flora what is it what is the matter my lord sobbed flora has quarrelled with mr coningsby an expression of eager interest came over the countenance of lucretia why have they quarrelled i do not know they have quarrelled it is not perhaps the right term but my lord is very angry with mr coningsby not very angry i should think flora and about what oh very angry madam said flora 
shaking her head mournfully. My lord told M. Villebecq that perhaps Mr. Coningsby would never enter the house again. Was it today? asked Lucretia. This morning. Mr. Coningsby has only left this hour or two. He will not do what my lord wishes about some seat in the chamber. I do not know exactly what it is, but my lord is in one of his moods of terror. My father is frightened even to go into his room when he is so. "'Has Mr. Rigby been here to-day?' asked Lucretia. "'Mr. Rigby is not in town. My father went for Mr. Rigby this morning, before Mr. Coningsby came, and he found that Mr. Rigby was not in town. That is why I know it.' Lady Monmouth rose from her sofa, and walked once or twice up and down the room. Then, turning to Flora, she said, "'Go away now. The book is stupid. It does not amuse me. Stop. Find out all you can for me about the quarrel before I speak to Mr. Coningsby. Flora quitted the room. Lucretia remained for some time in meditation. Then she wrote a few lines, which she dispatched at once to Mr. Rigby. End of chapter 5